Thank you. And then please, the people uh, attending in the winter school, let's try to keep it uh, as interactive as possible. So if you have questions and you want to interrupt me during the talk, please feel free to do so, yes? So I change a bit the title because I look a little bit at the program more in details and I saw that uh, on the interest and then I decided to focus a bit on on the biomimetics to just give you an example on how you can get inspiration from, from nature to develop application and also in the context of, of robotics. And then I will talk a bit about uh, biomaterials that I think are interesting for, for this type of purposes as well. So today, I don't know, do you see, do you also see the Zoom window or do you, do you see the, the picture of, do you see yourself on the screen or no? No, we, no, we don't, it's fine. Okay, okay, okay. So I will start the, the, telling you a little bit what is biomimetic. Then I will give you some example on, on the, some application that biomimetic uh, on different type of landscape. And then I will uh, address the point of how you can exploit uh, biomaterials for biomimetics. And in particular, I will, uh, I will focus on two types of materials, chitin and cellulose. And I will try to uh, make you understand a bit how the function of this property in nature, it's really, uh, sorry, how the structure of this, of this material in nature, it's really designed for a specific function and how you can actually then apply the same concept for material engineering when you, when you want to develop material. And I will also try to introduce the concept of hierarchical material, because I think this is a characteristic of, uh, of a natural structure that I think it's particularly convenient in, in a different variety of contexts. Okay, so let's start with what is not definitely biomimetic. So you see uh, birds that flies and then this flapping the wings and then you say, ah, there are also planes have, uh, as, have uh, big uh, wings and that's why they fly. Yes, the principle is completely wrong. And this is not the idea that uh, when we talk about biomimetic, we want to use. And uh, if some of you already like uh, familiar with research, often in, in many fields, this uh, biomimetic concept is a little bit uh, exploited as a buzzword, but it's not really, I think in some context is not really appropriate. So what is instead that you can consider biomimetic is application that you have, uh, that you might have seen also for some of you that flew here in the UK, that in the, at the, at the tail of, the, at the end of the wing of the, of the planes, often you observe this uh, structure that going up and this one are essentially, actually they have been really uh, optimized, inspired by the, the feathers of, of several different types of birds uh, on, the, on the wings. And uh, for aerodynam aerodynamic purpose, this type of structure essentially facilitate the, the flight and therefore reduce the, the consumption of, 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 of petrol for, for the plane itself. So this is an example of biomimetic. So taking a, so the idea is really trying to extrapolate a concept and apply it to the specific application. That doesn't mean that you, to find uh, link that are trivial, but to find the smart uh, link that inspire really to develop a type of application, this is what we can really call biomimetics. And, uh, you know, in, in, in the, if you want, like the process of learning and what we have learned so far as a human population since the, the, the old time, it's really a lot is based on, on the observation of nature. So, if you go to look into the definition, the biomimetics, uh, you can read biomimetics, biomimicry, is the emulation of model of system elements that nature use for a purpose to solve them, but then you apply to solve a human complex. And these are like some drawing of Leonardo that also tries to develop a wing uh, that are based on, on, on the flights of birds, yes? So, but biomimetics is a much more wide context, uh, yes? And it's wide because you find it in many different type of application. So from, uh, you know, you might, uh, if you, you are mainly focused on robotics, so a lot of the different type of robots are, sh are shaped and developed as images as humans or as images animals, yes? And that's not a chance 
but because this is a way that we are familiar in terms of locomotion. Sorry, Asehon. But however, biomimetic can also be exploited in other different type of context. For example, I am particularly interested in my material. So, but then you can exploit architecture that you find in nature to build lightweight materials that are uh, that can be exploited in consumption. Yes, but the biomimetic is also used to optimize property of surfaces, interfaces like self-cleaning process, anti-adhesive type of coating, like the one that you have on your non-sticky pens. Yes, or also exploited to improve fluidodynamics so that it's or aerodynamics as we have seen before. And uh, there are some different type of uh, uh, structured interface that can improve this one that are also inspired by nature. And um, now it's by, I think it's also exploited a lot in terms of architecture and design and in, in, in the context of really design optimization so that you use uh, algorithm that often um, start with some principle that you have in nature in order to minimize and produce material for example, that are capable to maintain a specific load or self-actuate using uh, this type of principle. So this is, it's a really wide field, yes? So in the most famous, I think, example that you might have uh, encountered of a biomimetic example is this, uh, is the Velcro. Velcro is inspired to these uh, plants and the person who discovered this essentially realized that uh, they developed the Velcro because he was uh, uh, taking his dog for a walk in a, in a field. And then the dog was covered by this, uh, by this plant that got stuck on the fur. And then from, from this idea, this concept, you know, copying the macrostructure of the tip of this, uh, of this plants that they have sort of hooks. Yes, and that's when they get entangled to a, to a tissue that, has, uh, that is uh, furry that they have developed Velcro, which is exploited everywhere. This is like a, a SEM image of this burdock that is essentially is the plant that produced that essentially inspired the production of Velcro. Similarly, in engineering, you can see, as I was telling you before, it is another example in aerodynamics where some of this uh, fast uh, high velocity train developed, I think is this one was the first one in Japan developed on the structure of this kingfish that essentially is particularly efficient in, in <coughs> oh my god sorry, that is particularly efficient in aerodynamics and also uh, in uh, uh, catching fish under underwater so without creating the minimum um, uh, the minimum impact in the water surface. So so that is efficient in doesn't uh, scare the fishes. And the the this is a similar example. Obviously, the design is not a one-to-one. -one. It's the same on the concept of the plane, but the principle of trying to optimize the aerodynamics is they are they are similar. Similar. And this is another example of uh, you know of uh, structure that it's uh, an application in, in engineering. These are self-sharpening knives, and this is inspired by the rodent teeth. And the rodent teeth are structured so that they have a two part, a soft uh, tissue and a hard tissue. And because you have this soft tissue and hard tissue, when you are actually uh, cutting the material, when you, when you have a conventional knife that it's, for example, at both the, the, the edge of the blade, the blade, they are both made of hard material because they, you want to cut. When you are removing material, for example, in this case, by laminating, removing laminates of material, you are consuming the, the knife, at the, especially at the tip, yes. So, but instead, if you exploit this concept of having a soft material at the top and a hard material only at the bottom, you might, at the beginning, uh, uh, have, be less efficient and have a little bit of a higher consumption of, of energy in order to perform the cut. But what you achieve is a self-sharpening mechanism for which but even if you consume this part, you always end up having a hard edge that is capable to cut instead than here where you are, when you reach the, 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 soft, uh, the soft material uh, pretty fast. And this is what I wanted to show you. That in the case of robotics, obviously, you have a, a, a huge uh, variety of examples. Obviously, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that many of you are famous with the different uh, robots that are made of, of from, from MIT. 
maybe less, uh, less frequent are these robots uh, that are inspired by plants, but also plants roots that have the similar type of sensitivity and scent and then capability, but this is uh, at the end uh, uh, the similar concept, yes. And uh, as I was telling you before, you, another thing that is important is also how you can design material and how you can take example from, from nature in design optimization. So for example, two of the materials that are particularly interesting in nature that for mechanical support are bones. Yes, because bones are what supports us in uh, our, our weight. And in the case of tree, because trees, they don't have a, they don't have a, skeletal, a skeletal support like us, but they are made only of polysaccharides. We will see in a moment as well. Uh, they need to use uh, fibers of, 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 of uh, plants, of polysaccharides, of cellulose, we will see in, in a bit in, in, the, in the few slides. And, uh, and when you look at the structure, for example, at the, at the macro structure, a different land scale, for example, of bones of what you find in tree, you can observe that actually the performances in terms of mechanical property of material are achieved with really low amount of material. And this is something that it's really interesting and it's a concept that can be applied directly to robotics and also soft robotics. Because in principle, you want to make robots that, and parts of the robots that are as, as light as possible, yes? Because more weight you have to carry, the more energy you need to use. And this is a principle that it's also used in nature for us, for humans. The less weight you have to carry, the better it is. And we know that, for example, also astronauts that go in on mission and stay for a long time into the space, uh, into this, uh, the ISA, the, the International Space Station, their bones, they, are, they, are, uh, they, they have to get supplements because they have to make, make sure that the bonds, they don't, um, they, they, they are more successful, suc more success, susceptible to break because in, with an absence of gravity, the bones again optimize and the rear and rechange their shape in order to accommodate the load. So when you go back into, into the, into, into back to the earth, that you have gravity again, the bonds have to again to readapt to the presence of this load. Yes. And so these are like, uh, just to make you understand that these are like, even if we don't think about it, these are dynamic systems that really self adapt. And the way that they self adapt, they try to optimize their form in function of the function that they have. And in this case, like in the case of, of, uh, of bones, but also in the case of uh, cellular structure in, in plants, in like in trees they optimize their char structural characteristic in order to be able to, to sustain weight. So to, they optimize it, but using as less material as possible. How do they do it? So there are, uh, there are uh, so here in nature, it's somehow uh, self-regulated. And what, and how this is, the, and how this is designed is not fully understood how this, the fiber are controlled, for example, in plant to develop specific uh, and adapt to specific load. It's, it's an open problem in plant biology, but you can apply this concept into, into, into material design. And so there are like uh, several different type of alg algorithm that um, are um, optimizing shape for a function that could be mechanical response, but it could be whatever other function that you like, uh, taking inspiration from natural example. So uh, here, for example, just, uh, just to show you, if you want to give uh, this type of program can essentially uh, minimize uh, after a certain number of rounds, they can minimize the amount of, of material that you need in order to, man to, to uh, keep a specific amount of load that is coming from the top. And uh, what it's interesting is like when you look at and the same as I was telling you before, like in the, so here it's a, it's a nice example that you see it in plants. And, uh, and, uh, if you look at this, uh, at the at the vascular bundles that are essentially are plant cell uh, that are uh, made with cellulose, and you look at the 
mechanical response that these plants have at the branches is particularly high. In fact, in order to break, in order to have a fracture into this, uh, into this, uh, into this uh, type of system, you need to apply quite a lot high load. Yes, and uh, you and if you if you look at how the fiber are arranged into this type of of, of plants, and you can and you mimic them using uh, materials. So this is an example of a biometric design inspired by these plants where they where where they use artificial fibers, both carbon fiber but also polymeric type of fibers, and they organize the fibrillar structure in an, in a way in a similar way to what is happening in the plants. And what they see, they see that is essentially in presence of this, uh, in, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, design that is similar to what has been uh, done in the plants, you are much more, you are much more, uh, you, you can support much higher stress with respect to have you to a standard arrangement of fibers as you would do like circular or 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 longitudinal to the direction of the axis yes so this is uh, this is really like you know this is these are uh, uh, examples that then can be really find a use in terms of a mechanical support application so let me show you so these are like fixed but there are also nice example of where you can get actuation so maybe this is not yet there in the so in like it you can do in robotics that you can program a motor to move at a specific speed here the speeds are much more are much more slower and they are slower because the in this case the actuation is a property of the material and to trigger an actuation in the material you are limited to some factor for example in this case in the case of the pine, is the diffusion of water within the tissue of the pine. So may, many of you maybe have seen that when you have a pine and you expose it either to, to high humidity or you dry it out, the, the lamellar structure within the pine, they open and close, yes? And this is essentially a self-actuating system that is passive. And the reason why it's passive and the reason why you obtain it is because this uh, this um, pine, they have uh, the fiber of the cellulose, like you were seeing here in this tree here, they are oriented in different direction within different layer. And therefore, because you have a different direction, you have a mismatch of uh, young moduli. So this behaves as what you can call the, the, the metallic bilayer effect, where you have a, the compression the, the, mis the mismatch between the stress between the first and the second layer essentially provides a stress, uh, uh, an actuation system. And, uh, and uh, what is interesting is that you can also obtain the sa same type of characteristic with really material that you have in front of you every day, like wood. So this is an example of a laminate of wood. So this laminate of wood are the same material that you also buy in any kind of uh, wood shop or also at IKEA when you buy a, a, a cheap uh, uh, furniture. Instead of giving you proper wood, they give you like uh, wood that is made out of uh, really thin sheets of wood where the fiber are oriented in different direction and they are glued simply on top of each other. And here you have a, a layer that is that is on top where you have the fiber of the wood oriented in one direction and the layer that is glue on top of a second layer where the fiber are oriented in an opposite one. And when, sorry, I don't know why it's not playing. Yes. And when you expose this to humidity, this is a video that is uh, fast enough, but what you can see, you can really observe a bending of the structure. Yes. And um, this type of material have, can be implemented in, uh, for example, this one is an example of a, a solar cell holder that in presence of sunlight can directly itself adjust the position and self-tune in order to follow, to follow the presence of the sun, just because when you obviously the part of the, of the panel that is exposed to the sun, the part of this part here, is exposed to the sun, it's dry, it's, it's, it's drier than the other one. And you can, you know, and this is works on several landscapes. So I show you this concept of the, of actuation that comes from mismatching mechanical property from, 
from this uh, concept of the metallic bilayer in a really large scale, but you can also achieve it on, on the nano and micro scale. And these are like uh, films that are also made of cellulose, where the cellulose is, uh, in this case, is on the nano scale. It's oriented in different direction. And then by creating this bilayer just with the humidity that you have on, on your hands, because you, you, you create a little bit of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of humidity on, as soon as you put something nearby, you can essentially actuate and bend these films. Another example that I think of, of really nice mechanical property are materials that have a negative Poisson ratio. So in, uh, in the, I think it's uh, something interesting also for, for application in robotics and I haven't seen much in this context. So generally material have a, a Poisson ratio that is defined as positive. And the partial ratio is what tells you how, how a material is essentially elastic. So just to have an idea, rubber has a passion ratio about 0.5. Instead, ceramics that are really hard and brittle, they have a passion ratio 0.2. But this means that every time that you take a material and you are elongate it in one direction, for example, you're elongating along the lateral direction, the material necessarily will be compressed in the opposite direction. Yes, so obviously when you have a rubber, you can elongate a lot, but you also have a lot uh, of compression in the opposite direction, yes? And, um, and uh, defining the, between the, you know, defining simply by the, how much the material has elongated in one direction, and how much has been compressed in the other one is the definition of the Poisson ratio. Interestingly, in nature, you can find material that instead they don't, that when you uh, compress in one direction, the material also expands in the other one. And, uh, and a nice example is the one is the is the skin of the meat of cows in the in the breast. Yes, they behave as a personal ratio. And uh, and now there are lots of different type of application in terms of material where you can find of material that uh, in uh, that under tension. So when you also are expanding, you have an expansion in both directions. And this is their call also oxetic material. And you find application already in commercially available. And this could be interesting, especially in the context of, of soft robotics, when you want to have material that, that adapt, but don't necessarily compress in one direction. And finally, so this is where a macro scale, to go back to the, uh, to the micron scale, these are like, uh, some of the example of uh, biomimetic material that are used, for example, for uh, in the swimming uh, clothes for athletes for high competition that mimic the structure that you have on, on the shark skin. And actually at the beginning, they even have banned this type of uh, swimming suits because the athletes were reaching uh, like a uh, uh, world record uh, of swimming because they, the, the resistance of water when you have this type of uh, architecture, it's really, it's much lower, yes. I go a little bit quickly. I want to just have a little bit of more time on giving you some example of some relevant material that I think it's, that can be interesting for soft robotics. So as I was telling you before, I like first to introduce the concept of hierarchical architecture. I talked to you before about the bones, as an inspiration for making mechanical material. And the bone is one of the, I think, easier example to just explain how, what hierarchical architecture is. So hierarchical architecture means that you go from different, that you have specific characteristic, a different landscape that are all important to provide a specific function. And combining or changing this type of uh, structure, a different landscape, can completely change the function and, and, and make the material adaptable itself. So when you have a bone, you have a specific tissue. The tissue is composed of many different uh, parts. You have the blood vessel. You have also, you have also the, instead you have the hard structure. And the hard, this hard structure essentially is made out of uh, mm, uh, lamellar structure that are made out of uh, collagen fibrils. And these collagen fibers are uh, interplaned within each other with the uh, hydroxyapatite crystal that is essentially sort of uh, 
cal calcium carbonate. So it's it's a it's a it's a inorganic inorganic material. And uh, if you go to look at different landscape, these collagen fibrils they are themselves made of smaller fibers that are sorry these collagen fibrils themselves they are uh, made up, they they build up larger fiber that are on the micron scale and when you look however even in the lower um, at lower magnification so you go to look inside this uh, fibers that are 50 nanometer itself you have the collagen polymer itself that are that are organized in the same way perpendicular in top of each other so you really have on a, on on different architecture you find fissures that are important and uh, and uh, this and if you want this the smaller fissure you can think it as a as a specific of a building block so like lego the way that you arrange these uh, nanofibers on the nanoscale in the way that you organize them can provide you a specific uh, function. So if you arrange them in a way that essentially that uh, the material is, you want to have mechanical support, you can find a way to arrange this building block in a way that are more stable. When you have Lego, you maybe instead of building something like this, you build something like that if you want to apply the load on top. In the case of bones, what you do, since you have material that are fibrillar, you make lots of fibrils and you stack them together. It's like similar to the concept of spaghetti. If you have one spaghetti itself, the mechanical property are not great because and you can easily break it. But when you have many, many, you can essentially, it's, it becomes really difficult to break the entire bundle. Yes. So, and this is the example of the bone. And uh, in uh, in terms of you know in terms of natural material biomaterial in order to make these uh, composites you have a huge variety in nature as well but the, you can find a big distinction between organic and inorganic so I will talk now I'll give you some example of organic one but there are also a lot of other example of inorganic material of mixture between the two mm -hmm. that are. Um, that can be exploited for a wide variety of function. And in nature, the majority of the, of the system that you find in order to, and, in, and one of the main function is mechanical support, is to create, is to make fibers. So fibers, they have, they, they are the one that are the basis of, of creating material with high performances in terms of mechanical responses. And in the, when you look into the natural fibers, the fibers that you, that you have is essentially cellulose fibers. And the cellulose, again, it has a hierarchical structure because you have molecule of glucose that form polymers. So they form like strings, again, of, of materials. And these strings, they entangle well, while they are biosynthesized with other cellulose uh, um, polymers forming, uh, forming five fibrillar structure that when they enter inside the plant cell wall, they mix with the other polysaccharides and, and lignin and create macrostructured macro fiber. That this is what's similar to also what you can observe in cotton. When you have a, a piece of cotton and you start to pull it apart, you can really see that you, you start to have an entangled bunch of fibers. And when you pull them, this fiber also detached one from each other, they just slip on top of each other. And this is because they are really hold by mainly hydrogen bonding. And in the case when you have them inside a cell wall, also the other polysaccharides. And when you think in terms of uh, characteristic of the fibers, what it counts in terms of, for example, again, I, I insist on mechanical properties because it's the easiest example, but you can find others I will also show in a moment. What it counts is the composition, yes, and to, to obtain specific, uh, a specific response. And uh, obviously the composition of this mechanical fiber is more or less always the same. The majority of the components are cellulose and lignin, and then you have a certain amount of hemicellulose that are all the other polysaccharides, pectin, wax, and then also some, some water, obviously. 
But when you go to look in terms of the mechanical properties, so for example, you look at the young modulus, when you look at the young modulus of this fiber, like flux, hemp, youth, they are not that far from <laughs> glass fiber that I use for construction now. So these are like material that in terms of performances are extremely good, despite the fact that are made only of sugars. Yes, main, mainly, made, mainly made out of sugars. And, uh, and when you look at them, you know, in terms of morphology, this, this type of characteristic and also imparted by the fact that you have a certain amount of, uh, of entanglement between the natural, poly, natural fiber that you don't see when you have uh, artificial artificial one, yes. And uh, as I was telling you before, and this is also a lot in nature, but it's also the basic principle to build up a based fiber-based uh, reinforced composite. If you want to have a composite material that has specific mechanical property in one direction, you can you can dope it with fiber that have a, that have a specific directionality. If you obviously create a grid one on top of each other, you can improve the directional, the, the mechanical response and vice versa, depending on how you arrange the fiber, the mechanical properties of this different type of system would be completely different. But what I think it's, uh, it's nice to show is that, you know, while, while you want to, you know, while you obviously, when you, when you took it look in terms of mechanical response, you want to have the highest, the toughest material, you want to be really high in this graph, you also want to maintain as much as you can a low density, yes? Because the more the mechanical property go up often, what is happening, the higher the density of the material, so the, heavy, the heaviest is the material. So this is like the area where you have the better performances in terms of mechanical response of metal, metal and alloys, but however, these materials are really, really heavy. Instead, if you look at the natural materials here, yeah, you have region where you reach reasonably high mechanical response, but then you can have uh, density that is an order of magnitude smaller, right? So I think it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a good uh, it's a good area to to for for creating material that are lightweight uh, lightweight as I was telling you before. Okay. So we talk a little bit about cellulose. I show you that it's pretty good for mechanical response. And uh, I want to just show you uh, for a moment how you can also use it for other concepts. So as I was telling you before, the cellulose is produced directly in fibers. And this fiber can be, can be, can be really different depending on from where you go and look at it in different plants. So this is uh, ignore it. So here, if you look at the morphology of different type of uh, plants, these are, are, for example, these are, sorry, if you look at the morphology, different type of cellulose that is extracted from different type of plants, the size of the cellulose fiber, the thickness in terms of length could be completely different. And also it is the crystallinity. So also the, the mechanical response of this fiber can be really different. And, but in some plants, this fiber can also be used not only for making mechanical composite material, but also to make optical material. Here, the picture of these uh, fruits and leaves here are obtained by using cellulose in the cell wall that is oriented at a slightly different angle. And by changing the angle in different layer, you can interact with light with a phenomenon that is called interference and, the, and then create color. Yes, and this is, for example, one of the systems that we often mimic in the lab using still also cellulose. I, I don't have time to go into the detail here, but we can make color material that look that has the same architecture of what you see in the plants but that are made only of cellulose and this one we can use them as coating we can make a kind of hologram so material that change the appearance in function of the angle because you when you when you move them and also let me just show you and then now we can also make them on, on large scale using large world equipment and we use them for example for making pigment and glitters this is what we what we do in the lab and and what it's actually nice is that this material can also be responsive and they are made only of cellulose this is what i want to insist here it's like a, a laminate where we use this cellulose based uh, material which is called hydroxypropyl cellulose and uh, by applying a, 
uh, weight here. You are simply walking on, on this uh, on this slide. You can see that the, the color is changing. And then you have a direct reading from the color into the pressure. So once you calibrate the system, you know that a certain color corresponds to a certain pressure. And what is nice is that the material that is doing this is essentially edible. So I would have bring some at the winter school if we were in presence because I like to bring the material there to people to show. But it's here it's me eating the material. And this is essentially the same that what we encapsulate here. So you probably have eaten it already because this hydroxypropyl cellulose is one of the main components that you have in the tablets of aspirin, not because it's a drug itself, but just because it's the it's the it's the material that you use in order to maintain the maintain the drugs inside. Yes. And uh, another polysaccharide that I want to show you here, it's really similar in terms of chemical formula. You, you don't need to, to mine too much, but also form hierarchical structure similar to bones and similar to the cellulose. So you have this uh, molecule that forms polymer structure that are assembled into fiber and this fiber on different length scale. And this is what, again, a hierarchical structure. They organize also in helicoidal architecture similar to the one that produced light. But now you have a different scale. And these different scales, in this case, give you a lot of mechanical response. So, and this is this principle, it's, uh, you find it a lot in, uh, in uh, crustaceous, mm -hmm. but also in, um, in uh, insects, uh, weevils. And again, here, like as I was showing you for the cellulose, if you look in different, here it's just looking at different parts of the weevils, the fiber of the chitin can be completely different. And uh, they are made. And the, by changing the size and changing the architecture, you can make really different uh, type of composites. So, and one of the, the example that I like to show is this one on this, uh, on this mantra shrimp that I am illegally reproducing this video from the BBC. Let me see if I can forward it a little bit or do we need to see it all? Maybe I do it like this. So here you will see this mantra shrimps that is uh, seeing a crab inside a, inside a glass. And then obviously the mantra shrimps wants to eat the crab. So in order to eat it, he start to punch with, the, with his cl uh, club here, this glass surface, and he breaks it. It access to the crab, and then also by punching the crab is essentially uh, breaking the exoskeleton. And if you look at here, so the people have done, uh, so the people have studied how it's possible for creating a biomaterial that is uh, able to resist the impact of this uh, of this punch because it's a really strong punch. And so they have done some some video to, and on a on a mechanical test. To test what is the what is the impact, yes, and then you can see that the force that is generated, uh, you know, on the on the on the sensor at the impact, it's it's really high. It's five hundred newton underwater. So you can imagine also imagine to to punch someone else underwater. It's you have also the resistance of water to fight. Yes, and how this is done is done by the is done by the by structuring this the surface of the of this club with the skiting fiber in specific direction so that the stress is redistributed uniformly into this impact region, and therefore that the, the, this uh, club can be exploited several times before the the animal has to do the the. Um, we lose it and then believe uh, create a new one. Yes, we'll do the um, the change uh, the change of the the change of the of the of this ex external skeleton. Yes, so I here it is. So this one it's people have studied with different technique. I don't go too much into the details, but what is the orientation of the fiber? What is the composition of the fiber? And by using this uh, this information with computer simulation combined to, to, to the modeling, they actually demonstrate that the presence of this helicoidal structure combined with the specific composition provides you a, a really like um, 
a good dissipation of the of uh, 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 provides a, a young model distribution that is an homogeneous along the club that uh, it's what provide a really good dissipation of energy during the impact so I know that this is a lot and it's a little bit different from what uh, possibly you are been used to to see I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview I hope that uh, you take some of the take-home messages that are important. And then the first one is that biomimetic, it's a nice concept, and, but you have to apply it wisely. It's not just to use as a, as a, um, as a simple, uh, as a simple uh, system. And, uh, and biomaterial can be used a lot for biomimetics. And this is particularly important in the context of what you want to do in the future of trying to exploit as much as possible natural resources and developing material that are not too bad for the environment. So if you start to use instead in glass fiber, uh, bio-derived fibers that have similar type of performances, you might obtain same, similar, similar type of behavior, but without uh, exploiting uh, material that are potentially uh, polluting. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer some questions. I saw that there is one in the chat and, uh, and I'll, I'll try to start with the one on the chat first. Yes. Yes. That, that'd be nice. Thanks. Read the question regarding the pressure sensitive film. Are they reuse, reusable or they work only for one shot application? Now this one are reusable. So you can, uh, you can, I'd only show the video going once. But depending on the characteristic of how we make the laminates, which type of polymer we use, the, the coloration it reco recovers. So this is actually a non-equilibrium state. So they go like this, and then if you leave it enough time, like 20 minutes, it go, it's gonna go back. And this is just only using this uh, edible material. We have exploited, that we, uh, we have used this material combined with a, another type of gelatin that is also edible. And in that case, it's much more, the, the pressure is much more instantaneous. I've done it, uh, we just published the paper, I didn't put it in the slide because I forgot. But it's in that case, you just press, you see the color change and as, and as soon as the pressure is not applied, the color goes away. Here instead, the, once you apply the pressure, you, you see the response. And then you have a certain recovery time that depends on the characteristic, also the geometrical characteristic of the of the of the of the of the of the, of the material. So I have two questions. There is a certain functionality in viewing negative in nonlinearity. Uh, is there a certain functionality viewer negatively in nonlinearity buckling can be viewed as a positive functionality? Yes. It is, for example, uh, this on this question. So this buckled structure that you that you see it's a, it can be a negative functionality for certain application if you want to have a, a perfectly smooth surf surfaces. For example, we exploit it to produce a material that have a that have a coloration into a layer. So, for example, this uh, this spontaneous buckling that can uh, that you can achieve between different type of polymer film. If you do it pro, if you do it with the right parameter, with the right type of polymer and the right lens scale, for example, can produce color. Depends a lot on the system that you are looking at. I think in sometimes this buckling can also be. You can also think about exploiting it in order to absorb better the stress between different material. But depends a lot on the type of application that you want. Had the problem of this, so uh, thank you for this question, Serena, about why uh, chitin or cellulose, I think it's the same, are not uh, exploited to produce this, this material because they are biosafe and biodegradable. This is, uh, so there are, it's starting to happen now. More and more people are trying to exploit this in the context of automotive and building. One of the main challenges is that being biomaterial, they always rely a lot in the source. So in terms of processing, you need to be a little bit more careful when you process. It's not like a glass fiber that you, once you produce it, it's always, always the same. This material, you don't make them, you really extract them from natural resources. 
So if you extract them from, uh, from one type of tree or from another one or from agricultural waste, the characteristic of this fiber is slightly different. So I was showing you bef before on this uh, table, yes. Because of this, uh, because of the difference in not only in composition, but also because of the difference in, the, in their uh, morphology. No, here was the morphology. Where is the morphology? Um, sorry. Here, but also because of the difference in their morphology, because you have slightly different composition, slightly different of morphology. If you extract the cellulose from different material, like flax, hemp, youth, sisal, that are all plants. So it's not, you have slightly different performances. And this is a little bit challenging when you go into the context of industrial application for especially automotive, because you want to have a material that it's always the same, that it's easy to, to source and more reliable to source. So I think that's what it's, uh, it's what is preventing more industry. But in terms of, of research, uh, there is a lot going on and there are lots of groups and lots of uh, material that have been promos promoted based on this type of, uh, of type of structure. So another question, how certain creatures like uh, Aperama fish in the Amazon has the tough and inflexible structure? What is it? A missing piece of replicated something like that. I am not, I am not familiar with this, uh, with this type of fish. But often what you have is that, so what, then, what, what you have is like, uh, you have composite material of inorganic uh, platelets of guanine and that are uh, inter interwoven within collagen structures, similar to what we have. And the, I think generally the secret is really the architecture and the chemistry of the material. So there are some concepts for which it's not that easy to crystallize material like in, in a chemistry lab, like, you know, as chemists, in the same ways as nature can do it inside cell. Because there are, comp there are lots of constraint in terms of, not only in terms of composition, but also the way that physically these properties are arranged. So, and, and that's, I think, some, something that is hindering a little bit uh, material research because often it's not really easy to obtain same type of performances that you get in nature just because of the challenges in the fabrication. In the, and, uh, and in nature, it's happening by self-assembly at room temperature, right? So it's, it's, it seems uh, it should be easier, but to make it in the lab, it it's can be really complicated. So I think it's what, what you need to do what we need to do, what, what, we, can, what we can try to, to understand this better is first to understand well also how nature is producing this material and from which are the characteristics of this material that are important to get the function. And then you can think about replicating them in the lab. But often there is also this extra burden that it's not necessarily straightforward on how you can really, um, it's not easy to, to replicate the condition that you have in the living organism. Eh? Mm. Uh, okay, what do you think about the possibility of exploiting biomass to extract synthesized biomolecule? I read the big obstacle of efficiency extraction and chemistry needed for the process. Yes, Serena, you are perfectly right. So the one of the main problem that you have there is that uh, is the separation. That's the main challenge. So that often that the energy and the pollution that you create for separating this molecule apart is more than what, uh, is, more than what is actually economically viable. There are, this is like a branch of science itself, you know, these pe people working on bioreactors and to, for, for, for efficient separation of biomass. It's a, it's a completely one field of, of research and people are, that they are trying to develop. I think that uh, what we need to do is to try to understand better what type of biomass can be exploited for which type of application. So we work, for example, with uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, uh, company that are giving us uh, some waste, yes. And uh, 
but also try to understand what is the the relationship between this the, the chemical characteristic of this bio waste we can then understand okay this material could be used with minimum treatment for this type of application so that that's a way in my opinion that's the best way to go while other people are also doing a lot and i think it's also important but the the having a full separation it becomes really difficult because this material as i was showing you before they are entangled on a really on a molecular scale so it's really difficult to pull them apart think about of the people have troubles to to recycle tetra pack right where you have multiple layer one on top of each other and these are micro sized layer so think about of separating things that are on a molecular molecular scale intricated next to each other so it's chemically it's chemically costly and uh, in terms of yield can also be ineffective that's why that's why this is challenging yes but i think it's a but i think it that nevertheless i think it's something that needs to be looked into because other because if we want to stop polluting and start to use this material a little bit more it's something that we need to try to find a way so and that's in my view is that if you understand a bit better uh, the less you decompose and the better it is because then you can try to exploit this material directly for another application so you show some hierarchical nanostructure in nature bone where the nanostructure are built into macrostructure in biometric we often mimic at only one scale can we build system that um, yes Jonathan this is a good question so the question is like can you build uh, artificially system where you copy also the hierarchy a different landscape the answer is yes in some cases, but it is challenging. So I showed you the the the, the and the challenge is challenges because you need to control different landscape at the same time. In living organisms, you have a compart the concept is compartment compartmentalization, and also this is in material science. People are starting to develop this concept, eh? developing, for example, macrofluidic system where uh, they make um, balls on macron scale and then inside different of this ball they then have specific coating so that they uh, merge with each other creating um, larger scale so there are some system but in general it is more challenging to control different land scale at the same time and that's why often uh, people do myomimetic only on one specific scale, but there are examples, and I think there are ways to overcome that. Um, I think it's uh, it's nice. Mm, by the way, isn't the availability of this type of uh, isn't the availability of of types of cellular strength uh, for person? I I'm not sure, Serena, if I understood the question. Isn't the availability of type of cellulose a strength? For example, just youth fiber. Uh, yes, I understood. So if the, the question is like the fact that you have a many different type of characteristic of fibers, you can use each of them one for a specific function. And this is true. It could be it could be seen as a strength. But when you then go into, you know, when you then go into a industrial use, this becomes a problem because you then, for example, because you cannot grow the cellulose chemically, you have to synthesize it. You just, the plant has to synthesize it. So you also have to, to cultivate these plants. And then you start to think about also the problem of the cultivation of cotton, yes, which is now, which is, which is highly consuming in terms of water. And also now the exploitation of cotton also for textile industry. Yes, it's a material that is needed, it's raw material. But then people don't want to cultivate it in uh, in some other area because they maybe it's not really the most uh, it doesn't provide it's not a really valuable from the point of view of economic uh, cost so it, it ends up to be cultivated in areas that are really arid yes and create more of the problem so ideally the best solution would be to have a material that you can find it everywhere and you can exploit it in different contexts also to to ensure this uh, a bio variety, yes, a variety. Instead, if you only need to cultivate one specific species, that can also become uh, environmentally problematic, not only economically problematic, yes. 
So in principle, yes, you can use one material to produce it, and that would be a strength, but then it's, uh, it's um, it, and for biomass. And here, the last question to write that I think it's, uh, is it easier to build your own cellulose that extracting from biomass? It's impossible to build cellulose from scratch. So there are some group that can build molecule. So do you have molecule? Because it's glucose, it's just glucose molecule, the same glucose that you have in your blood. And they attach them synthetically one next to each other and they make a cellulose polymer. Yes, but they can reach a certain length. They cannot go on. And the process is stupidly expensive because the chemistry is really difficult. And instead, if you think about in plants, it's the byproduct of uh, photosynthesis because you reproduce the glucose and then the glucose is somehow other using two way as a storage in, in forms of starch. That's what gives the plants uh, food or mechanical response to keep the plants alive, keep the plants stable, cellulose. So there is no way to, there is no way that you would be able to chemically produce cellulose in the lab on the rhythm of what is done by a plant. You will be always uh, surpassed as many PhD students you can employ.